So we're, like Jared was talking about, we're, we're five weeks into, this is the fifth week into our series on distracted, right? This, this idea that we live distracted lives and how do we become un, undistracted? Um, I just want to go through and we'll make a, I'll, I'll recap kind of the weeks that we've been at. We'll talk a little bit about um, this week, and then we'll try and get some application for us as we go along, okay? So the subject matter we're talking about is something that I've been wrestling with in my own life, something that uh, God has brought to the forefront uh, for me and uh, my family and our busyness and our craziness that we have going on. It's this idea of margin and what that looks like. And so by all means, I'm no, I'm no expert on the subject matter, but um, I would say I'm actively being refined in this in my life, okay? And so we'll learn. I know God's taught me some stuff this week as I've been studying, and we'll learn together, and we'll try and be better moving forward, okay? So like I, like I said, this is the fifth week. Uh, we've, uh, the first three weeks, um, we were looking at what a distracted life is all about. And so week one, we talked about the danger of a distracted life, never truly seeing beauty or knowing peace, because the room in our lives is filled with unfinished puzzle piece, uh, puzzles piled on top of each other, right? It was that illustration of Jared dumping out the puzzles, and we were all like, no. But he dumped out two different puzzles and mixed them all together, and that's kind of how our, our lives look as, uh, that are distracted, okay? And then week two, we talked about the problem with progress and technology. A distracted life is eager to add Jesus but that relationship is just added to all the unfinished puzzles in our lives. We don't work on limiting our distractions, okay? We don't work on taking things out so that we can be, have more focus, be undistracted, right? Technology plays a huge part in that, and we talked about that, like the Instagrams and the Facebooks and the scrolling and all this kind of stuff. That leads to distraction. Week three was all about... Uh, a distracted life being constantly tired and anxious because true rest will only come from working harder. Right? That doesn't make sense. But um, for us uh, to live in a uh, not distracted life, it, it doesn't come from working harder. Right? It comes with probably healthy boundaries, which is kind of where we're going to go. And then last week, we pivoted from looking at what distracted lives look like to what focused lives look like. And Jared talked about how a focused life sees every day as an opportunity, believing our minutes have value and they shouldn't be wasted, right? A focused life sees every day as an opportunity. That was one of those lines that just kind of hit me in the heart of, man, I live life sometimes wanting or killing time, right? And Jared talked about that, killing time when every moment and every day of every day is an opportunity. It's an opportunity to do something good. It's an opportunity to praise the Lord, um, yeah, and be with others. So that brings us to today. And today we're talking about margin. And so a focused life has margin. And when we have margin in our lives, we're able to have rest and we're able to have a healthy balance. Okay? So we're going to talk mostly about margin and rest today. What an appropriate topic to talk about on Mother's Day, right? It's like we planned this out or something. <laughs> Moms take on so much and have the most responsibility in our families. There is no one in my life that does more or takes on more than my wife. And I'm sure that that's the same for all of us husbands out there. My hope is that this message can spur thoughts and change in our lives so that we and our moms can gain, re can gain margin and rest. We live in a culture that applauds busyness and excess. I'll say that again. We live in a culture that applauds excess and busyness. We applaud those who have three houses and five cars, those who work or seem successful because they're always doing something, 
In our culture today, these are badges of honor. It's the whole Instagram, Facebook phenomenon of look at me and look at how much stuff I have, what exotic vacation I'm on, or what I'm doing. This all leads to craziness because as a culture, there hasn't been a time in history where we've worked more hours, had more debt, debt, or slept less. And my research as of 2021, so we know that this number has grown, but total American debt was at an all-time high of $15 trillion. Think about that. $15 trillion. We are pursuing worldly things because they are what we have been told bring meaning to our lives. But in all actuality, they just cover up emptiness, loneliness, and sadness. All of these pursuits lead to less rest and more worry in our lives. We have little to no more margin. Margin can be applied to two main areas in our daily lives, and we will talk about both of them today a little bit. I'm sure there's other areas that margin can be applied to, but the two main areas that we'll talk about are schedules and finances. So your calendar and your pocketbook, both touchy subjects, I know. And Jared probably did that on purpose, right? So. No. So as we go on, let's, let's go ahead and talk about margin. What is margin? Right, there's different, there's different definitions of margin. Uh, if you look it up in the dictionary, Webster's Dictionary, it says a border or edge. Um, it gives a couple of other definitions. Uh, there's, a, there's a business definition. It's, it says it's the difference between the cost and the selling price, right? So uh, in business, you have what's called a profit margin. Well, uh, something costs me a dollar, I'm gonna sell it for two, so my margin is a dollar, right? So it's that difference between the cost and the selling price. But, I'm gonna, but I wanna define it differently today. I wanna define it, um, and so we know we're on the same page of what we're talking about and what margin is, okay? Margin, is operating at less than capacity. Operating at less than capacity. Or <clears throat> financially, it's spending less than you make. Margin is spending less than you make. Okay? In Genesis 2, 1 through 3, it says this, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them, and on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. God gives us a picture of margin. God doesn't have a capacity, right? He can do everything always. But he limited himself to work under his capacity by resting on the seventh day. He could have worked, but that's not the model he wanted to set for us. He wanted to set a model of what margin looks like, right? Every one of us have been created differently by God, and we all have different capacities. Jared, mine is different than Jared's. Jared's is different than Jordan's, and so on, right? I, I think of a piece of paper. Right? We, we could have a piece of paper that's this size. This is probably my, mark, my capacity. Right? Jared's is this, you know, and Jordan's is like a poster board. She's a mom. Right? We're, we're dads. Our, we got the small, and she gets the huge poster board. Right? And so the margin, like, we could fill this paper up with words. It has capacity, right? It has the, the full page is its capacity. But... It has margin. It has areas that it doesn't have words in. That's like us in our lives. We need to have areas that we don't have work in, right? <clears throat> the key is to operate at less than, not more than your capacity. Which brings us to our passage this morning in Matthew. This passage 
picks up at a pivotal part in Jesus' ministry. He has been performing miracles and ministering to people's needs, but has begun to experience open rejection from his people. Even through all the things that he's done because of this, Jesus starts rebuking and condemning cities and the people that live in them because they haven't received his message. They haven't received him and his message of salvation, turning from their sins, repenting and turning from their sins. He's been rejected, and this rejection is just beginning. And this is the first time that we see that. And But through this rebellion and rejection, we see in verse 25, this isn't part of the, the passage this morning, but we see in verse 25, it says this, at that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father. Right? So even through all this rejection, all the rebellion against him, he still praises his Father. And our, and our passage picks up at the end of him talking with the Father. Let's read it again, Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this, this passage, this passage that gives us rest, gives us a hope of rest. I pray that you'd be with us as we look at this passage and, and uh, try to dissect it and apply it to our lives, that we can, we can gain knowledge, we can gain wisdom, and uh, we can put it into practice, Father. This is your time. Speak to us. In your name we pray. Amen. In this passage, Jesus is talking to those who are weary and heavy laden. Those who labor until they're worn out. Those who are tired as a result of excessive exertion, sin, or oppression. Back during this time, weariness and burden and a heavy yoke was brought on by trying to adhere to all the laws put in place by the Jewish leaders. And in my research, there were 613 laws that they were to adhere to. I don't know about you, but that's a heavy burden, right? So that's, what, that's where, we're, we're, where we meet, where we come to. He's talking about these people that have been put under this heavy, heavy yoke. Today, it might look differently, right? Our heavy laden may be our job. It may be our responsibilities outside of our work it may be family life, it may be busyness, it may be debt, right? Or you might be like me and a small business owner trying to stay in compliance with all the taxes that need to be paid to keep our business going. I've got to pay the state of Colorado, the federal government, the Jeff Jefferson County, city of Arvada. It becomes a lot and burdensome, especially trying to keep track of the due dates of all those. <laughs> Whatever your burden or weariness looks like, Jesus is here for you. That's the message. That's what I want you to get. If there's nothing else you get today, Jesus is here for you. He is the answer. There are a couple of aspects to point out in this passage that I think are significant. First, I think we have a slide for this too. First, verse 28. Jesus' invitation is for all to come. It is no longer an exclusive to the Jews. He has now opened the invitation and opened the door for all to come and believe and take his yoke. Salvation is his free gift for us. That's the first observation. In chapter 10, it was all, he was preaching to the Jews, right? It was all about an invitation to the Jews because they knew he, uh, you know, they, they, he came to fulfill the law, right? 
And so he was talking to the Jews and inviting them. But now in this passage, he opens it up to everybody, Jews and Gentiles alike. Okay? So that's the first aspect. The second, twice Jesus says that he will give us rest. First in verse 28, he says, I will give you rest. This is the peace that comes from salvation. This rest is the peace that comes from salvation. And the second time in verse 29, he says, you will find rest for your souls. Is the full thing. This is the peace you find with surrender. Right? So the first rest is the, is the rest you find from salvation. And the second rest for your soul is the, is the peace you find with surrender. The rest you find with surrender. So we need to surrender our lives to, to Christ. Jesus is telling us that he and he alone is the one who brings freedom from all these excessive things, from our bondage and busyness. He is the one who brings peace. If we come to him and take his yoke, he gives purpose to our pursuits, and ultimately he gives us salvation through faith in him. He is saying you won't need to pursue, pursue material possessions or excess or busyness because you will be pursuing the one thing that matters, me. My yoke is easy and my burden is light, is what he tells us. So how can we change our lives so that we can gain, so that we can have margin, that we can, that we can find rest, for our souls. This is the application part. And for the ac application, I, I love using acrostics for application. To me, they're easy to remember. It's short and simple. And so for this acrostic, we're going to use the word rest. R-E-S-T. Rest. Okay? So how can we gain margin in our lives? Well, the first one we, we sang about in the first song, Forever Rain, right? We're running to his arms. The first way we can find margin is to run to Jesus. This is where it all begins. Okay? This, there's a joke in Christian circles that if you don't know the answer to a, a biblical question, right, you always say Jesus, because Jesus is always the answer. Well, in this, in this case, Jesus is the answer. It's true, right? Jesus is the answer. Change and margin begins with him. Begins with Jesus. He is our hope and the one we should always look to. But we have a tendency, especially in our culture, to be self-sufficient. Thinking we can do whatever on our own and in our own way. But we need to run to him so that he can initiate the change we need in our lives. Look again at verse 28. Right? <clears throat> he says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I want to focus on that word come. In Greek, it's, it's uh, this word diute. Spelled D-E-U-T-E. -E. Pronounced diute. It translates to come, but it's not just this, hey, come. It's it's an exclamatory word. It has importance and eagerness. It's like, come to me. Sorry, I didn't mean to scare the baby. <laughs> but that's the key. He's telling us to come with, excited, with excitement, with eagerness. The key is to run to Jesus because all, because all of us have a little bit of Jonah in us, Right? All of us have this, we want to run from Jesus. We want to do things our own way. Like when God comes to Jonah and tells him, I want you to go to the Ninevites and give them my message, they're going to repent. He runs, right? Gets on this boat, gets swallowed by a whale. It's not until then that God gets his point across that, no, you're going to go. Stop running. We need to stop running. We have a tendency to run from God to try to hide from him. But we need to change this tendency and this reflex to run to him. 
We need to run to him with our worries, our ailments, our stress, our tiredness. We need to run to him for helping create margin in our lives. He will guide and direct us in ideas and, and give us wisdom and what it looks like to operate at less than our capacity. Proverbs 2, 6 through 8 tells us, For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity, guarding the paths of justice and watching over the way of his saints. Then you will understand righteousness and justice and equity, every good path. For wisdom will come into your heart and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Sounds like he gives us wisdom, knowledge. Whatever you need, Jesus is always there. So let's run to him. Second letter is E, right? <clears throat> How do we create margin? Well, we eliminate. <clears throat> or erase. You can use erase too. We take scissors, a scalpel, right? This might be the hardest step for us to do because we can justify anything and most of us don't want to let others down, right? This is especially hard for us people pleasers out there. I'm a people pleaser, it's especially hard for me. It's hard for us to say no. But this is a necessary and needed step in creating margin. Without going through this exercise, you will never have margin and you will always be operating at full or over capacity. A lot of times, I know I've had this feeling recently and I shared this with, with Jared, that I feel like I'm doing a lot of things, but I'm not doing anything, one thing well. When that is the way you feel, it's time to eliminate things, right? That's, that's God telling you, man, let's scale it back. Let's work at less than capacity so that we can do things with excellence. Greg McCohen <clears throat> wrote a book called Essentialism, and it's a book that my wife has been reading, and uh, he makes this point in talking about el eliminating. He says, when making decisions, deciding the cut can be terrifying. The truth is, it is the very essence of, deci of decision making. In fact, the Latin root of the word decision, cis or sid, literally means to cut or to kill. Yes, making the choice to eliminate something good can be painful, but eventually every cut produces joy. Maybe not in the moment, but afterwards, when we realize the additional moments we have gained can be spent on something better. Right? We all are doing good things in our lives. Our schedules are full of them. So eliminating can be painful. But like he says in this, every cut produces joy because we can spend time doing something even better with that. Decide what you want to keep in your, in your schedule and things, and things that can be taken out. Earlier in his book, Greg talks about <clears throat> deciding what to give your time and effort to. And since we're in church, I'm changing the language a little bit. But he says, no more yes, yeses. It's either a heck yeah or no. So if you look at your commitments and schedule and you can't say emphatically, heck yeah, I want to do that or keep that commitment, then this is a good indication and a good time to start eliminating that from your schedule. That way you can gain margin. Same goes for finances, right? Same goes for finances. We need to be able to eliminate things from our budgets, our spending plans, from our lives. <clears throat> when God was setting up his economy, he gave instructions, right? And in Leviticus 19, 
9 through 10, these are part of his instructions. <clears throat> he says, when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right up to, the, to its edge. Neither shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. And you shall not strip your vineyards bare. Neither shall you gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and the, for the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. His economy, he's setting up margin. He's telling the people, don't sow to the edge. Leave something. Leave a margin for the sojourners. When you pick grapes, don't pick the, the vineyard bare. Leave some. We live in a world where we can buy now and pay later. Sorry to say, if you can't afford it now, chances are you aren't going to be able to afford it later. Say no to yourself or save, it for, or save up for it and purchase it with cash. Eliminate expenses from your lifestyle and, this is a key point, or choose a lifestyle that fits your income so that you can have margin which then will allow you to give generously to the poor and needy, like God is telling us in Leviticus. He wants us to be able to give generously, and he wants to give to us generously. And part of that is having margin, margin in our spending plans and our budget. So that's E. S. Strategize. Strategy. This is our plan of attack. God has blessed each one of us with a brain and with reason. Let's use these tools. Sometimes my kids don't use them. Sometimes I don't use them. But let's use them, okay? Let's use these tools that God has given to us to help gain margin in our lives. Come up with a strategy, a plan of attack. We read this last week, but in Ephesians 5.15, it says, Look carefully, then, how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of time. And in James 1, it says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generous, generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. A great first step to a good strategy or plan of attack is setting boundaries and limits to live by. We need to have reason and wisdom in setting these, these boundaries. If applying boundaries to your schedule, be intentional. Block off time. Block off time for God. Time for family. Observe a Sabbath day and keep these boundaries so unexpected things don't creep up and steal your margin and rest. We got to say no. Okay? Operate less than your capacity. Some of us may need to determine what our capacity is. We need to do that so that we can have a plan in place where we operate at less than our capacity. So that's applying it to your schedules. What about applying it to your finances? This is where the big bad B word comes into effect, right? Budget. I'm a finance guy. I, I can do budgets all day long, but I know it has a negative connotation to it, so I like saying spending plan, right? We're going to have a spending plan. You guys need to come up with a spending plan and stick to it. Again, say no to yourself. Determine what, an, what is enough. A great example of this is John Wesley. I know that we all know, <clears throat> right? He was a theologian and an evangelist in, in England. He started the Methodist movement within the Church of England. Well, he decided one year, enough was enough. He was going to live off of 28 pounds. So he did it for the first year. 
He cut things out, didn't spend money on frivolous things. He lived on 28 pounds for that one year. At the end of the year, he decided, man, this was awesome. I'm going to do this for the rest of my life. 28 pounds was comfortable for me to live off of, so I'm going to do it for the rest of my life. Well, every year, his earnings went up. He kept writing. He started writing, and his his uh, his pamphlets sold, kept selling and growing in sales. Where eventually he made fifteen hundred pounds in one year. Again, he only lived off of the twenty-eight. So he was able to give one thousand four hundred and seventy-two pounds away to the poor and needy. Why? Because he had a limit. He set a boundary and stuck to it. He decided on a way of living that gave him margin in his life so that he could give generously, just like God directs us through in Leviticus. So we need to strategize and have a plan of attack to gain margin in our schedules and finance. Which leads me to the last letter, T. All of this is well and good, but it doesn't mean anything unless we take action. <clears throat> We've all heard the phrase, talk is cheap, right? Talk is cheap. We've got to put it into action. We've got to do it. Again, in James 1, it tells us to be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving ourselves, right? If we're hearers only, we deceive ourselves. But if we are doers... We don't deceive ourselves. So let's take action. Having margin requires action on our part. It's all great to run to Jesus for guidance, have a strategy, a plan of attack of what you're going to do. Know what you want to eliminate from your schedules or your finances. But if you don't do anything or take action, it actually doesn't mean anything and you're in the same place that you started it, right? If we look back at our text in Jesus 29, he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I believe that accomplishing this, meaning taking his yoke, it requires action on our part. We must take and learn from him. Both of these require action and effort on our part. Jesus is meeting us more than halfway but he wants us to close the gap. It's like he's meeting us 90% of the way and we just need to go the other 10%. It reminds me of the movie Hitch. Have you guys, have everyone seen the movie Hitch? I know that there's young people in the crowd and I don't know. This is showing my age, but we all know the movie, right? It's Will Smith and Kevin James, right? He's the date doctor or whatever helps people get their dream girls. Well, he's teaching Kevin James in one scene. He's keep teaching Kevin James about the kiss, right? It could be Allegra Cole's a last first kiss. And Kevin James starts freaking out about it. In it, Hitch is t teaching Albert Brenneman the signs that, that the women, women give that they want the kiss, right? And that most men go the full 100% and are too aggressive in the kiss. The secret to the kiss, he says to Albert, is going 90% of the way. Let her come the other 10%. Right? Well, that's kind of what we're, what we're at with taking the yoke. I believe that God wants us to go the 10%. Jesus wants us to go the 10%. He's come the 90. He's always pursuing us. Like in the song we were seeing, his goodness is running after us. We just need to close the other 10%. We need to take that action and close the 10%. I think that is exactly what Jesus wants from us. He wants us to be willing participants in taking on his yoke so that our, so that our burdens are less and his goodness in our lives is more. He wants us to have margin. He wants us to have balance. And ultimately, he wants us to have rest in him, rest in our salvation in him, 
and rest in our surrender in him.